So our next speaker is Dr. Saeed Gilani, who's director of the cath lab at University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. Saeed, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Um, and it's always fun to talk to the fellows, uh, especially when, who are just starting the cardiology fellowship uh, with all the ex enthusiasm, excitement, and energy. I've been given tasks to talk uh, about IVIS and uh, FFR in 12 minutes, and I hope to finish it on time. So as you know, this is a, a FFR is hemodynamic assessment of the coronary uh, atherosclerotic stenosis. And uh, IVIS is an anatomical assessment of the structure of the atherosclerotic disease and can be used to, for assessment of stent deployment also. We'll start off with intravascular ultrasound. Ultrasound, as you know, just like echocardiogram, if those of you who have been in the echo lab, it takes a long time to, before you understand what gray and shades of gray to all the way to brightness actually mean. So it takes a little bit of time and experience to understand these, but uh, Ultrasound is ultrasound. It creates a grayscale image from the reflection of the ultrasound waves from structures. And uh, the two kinds of ultrasound that, is, that are available for coronary imaging are uh, mechanical and phased array forms. The mechanical picture is on the top, made by Boston Scientific, and uh, uh, the phased array is by Volcano. The mechanical ultrasound has one transducer close to the tip of this catheter. Right here, it's in a plastic sleeve very plus thin plastic sleeve, and it rotates at more than 1,000 RPMs. And that one transducer, as it rotates, it's pulled back by mechanical, mechanically or manual pullback, and you can create a three-dimensional uh, circumferential view of the artery. The other one is a phase array, which is uh, we have in our cath lab. It has multiple transducers that are sequentially arranged around the circumference. And in this catheter is, each, each transducer is sequentially fires to create a three-dimensional circumferential view. <clears throat> so the resolution of the ult <clears throat> intravascular ultrasound is approximately 100 to 200 microns, which is not excellent as it is for the uh, optical coherence tomography, but is decent enough to provide good information about coronary anatomy. So this is just looking at a normal anatomy versus the histology. You can see the first, uh, the blood usually appears dark. <clears throat> And the blood to intima border or is the one where, where you can differentiate uh, echo reflection and some brightness, which is, in, and that intima is loose connective tissue, so it's less, dark, less um, uh, bright compared to adventitia. In between adventitia and uh, intima is the medial layer, which is made of smooth muscle fibers, which have little echo reflections. So it will appear dark. So that will be usually the area where you, where you start measuring your atheroma is, uh, is from the outer border between adventitia and media. That is called plaque plus media measurement. And then lumen, obviously, you can see that. So intravascular ultrasound has been used for disease assessment. You can assess lesion significance, plaque burden, percent stenosis, plaque composition, if it's fibrotic, if it's loose plaque, fibro fatty, fatty, or if it's uh, calcification. You can assess the size of the reference vessel for stent sizing. There's a lot of data on optimizing stent implantation for IV by using intravascular ultrasound. And, uh, and you can use this to measure the stent diameters, stent length, stent placement, apposition, expansion, and uh, identify complications at the edges. This data that is shown that the IVS leads to larger, uh, picking the larger sizes of stents and find the lumen area and lumen dimensions is usually bigger with IVS guidance. And uh, that indirectly leads to better outcomes down the line. It doesn't add cost and time to the procedure. Time is less of an issue. Cost sometimes is an issue. It's, just, it's about approximately 700 plus minus dollars per catheter. <clears throat> So there's a lot of ways to make the measurements. They are very simple. They seem complex, but actually it's very, very easy. So you can measure, make measurements of the, of the, of, at the distal reference, pro, proximal reference, average reference lumen size. You can lo use lumen measurements by just drawing the intima lumen border. And, uh, uh, and, between, and if you want to measure the black burden percent stenosis, you can measure this uh, blue line is the black plus media, which is the adventitia media border. You, you draw that and minus 
the lumen will give you percent stenosis divided by, multiplied by 100. And similarly, you can use the measurement for stent diameter, minimum, maximum, and intimal fibrosis. Uh, intima, uh, you can measure the uh, percent stenosis also. So for example, if you made a, a pullback um, uh, recording of the intravascular ultrasound, considering this as your reference, this is your area of maximum stenosis. So at the reference area, which is A, you can have a plaque plus media, which is the uh, EEM, external elastic membrane area, or lumen area. Most of the time, you will be using lumen area as a reference for your stent deployment, sizing of the stent. And, <clears throat> and then you draw it to your uh, uh, IOS image down to the area of maximum stenosis, which is the lumen area drawn in red. So green minus red divided by the green multiplied by 100 will give you percent stenosis. Then if you were concerned about looking at the plaque burden and the size of maximum stenosis as a lesion B, which is plaque plus media, this external elastic membrane uh, lumen area minus the lumen area for, this, uh, for, the, you know, for the area of stenosis divided by the maximum area, which is this, multiplied by 100 will give you plaque burden. Those are the, some of the more common measurements that you make. You can use IVS for a lot of, lot of uh, to help your, uh, in any, any clinical situation where you have a question. In this case, we had a ST segment elevation MI in a patient who had dual LED system. As the LED cutoff was so smooth, we could not see the ostium. We could see that apical LED was getting some collateralizations. We used intravascular ultrasound to identify the location of exact uh, uh, LED occlusion. This is marked by right here. And we gave TPA to make it more prominent and created flow and uh, created a uh, successful procedure. So this is an a ultrasound image uh, using the 20 megahertz single uh, the uh, uh, phase array system. Uh, you can see the intima to lumen border. Then you can see the media. Obviously, the re resolution is, like I said, 100, 150 microns. It's not as perfect. Sometimes you cannot see the intima all the way around. Uh, but then you can, but you can have an idea. And then the adventitia is bright, so this is the area that you, this will be the, in the normal artery. You don't have anything in this uh, anoatherosclerosis. This is an area where there's, a, there's an intramural hematoma in the vessel. You can see the blood in the intimal space appears darker. And uh, uh, this led to the diagnosis of intramural hematoma. It does not look like atherosclerosis. Uh, this is a this is another uh, research area for uh, for the intravascular ultrasound. Virtual histology is available in some IVS consoles. Uh, this is a, a this a, this uh, uh, is called a non-calcified attenuated plaque. This is equivalent of a sort of vulnerable plaque with the necrotic core. And in this case, you have no calcification because there's nothing brighter than adventitia, but there is attenuation of a, a, of the ultrasound waves. So this indirectly means there is a presence of necrotic core. So this is, in, on the other hand, a soft fiber fatty plaque, but it, you, there's no attenuation, so it's less necrotic core. So this is a picture of deep calcification, creating a shadow. This is a superficial calcification, creating a shadow and reverberation artifact. This is just a fibrotic plaque. You can see, identify your stent struts very easily on the intravascular ultrasound imaging. You can see these stent struts over here help you identify, uh, optimize your stent positioning and sizing. This is a patient with acute, acute myocardial infarction with the traumatic occlusion of the right coronary artery with the area of plaque rupture or, or erosion. And uh, IVS is not very good at identifying thrombus versus soft plaque. Sometimes you really have to it has to be large enough and it has to be mobile and separated from the intima for you to differentiate that. But if you inject contrast, sometimes you can see the, the separate, see the blood flow around the thrombus to differentiate that. This is most likely just atheromatous soft atheroma with plaque rupture. This is a better example of a thrombus. This is LED with a thrombus here. And as you can see the blood flowing around it, there's a filling defect in the vessel. So it's easy to see if you have a stent deployment on angiography, like Dr. Reisner mentioned, it's a two-dimensional view. Uh, you're unable to see if the stent is really opposed to the vessel wall or not. IVS provides you excellent pictures to accomplish better stent acquisition.
So let's talk about uh, the role of IVS in identifying uh, uh, luminaria stenosis or significance of, uh, uh, of coronary stenosis. There's a lot of data on, on left main and non-left main, left main vessels. For left main vessels, there are three main studies that have looked at the uh, role of FFR correlating with, with the, sorry, IVS cor luminaria correlating with the FFR, which significant range, which is considered between less than or equal to 0 0.80 to 0.875. So it, the, the study from the North America, Dr. Mr. Ja Dr. Jasti, uh, suggested 5.9 was, was the cutoff for optimizing the significant, for finding this uh, FFR less than 0.75 in the left main. And that is considered, even by the AUC area, appropriate use criteria for stable ischemic heart disease, it recommended that if you have left main stenosis on the IVUS, it's considered significant. If the minimum lumen diameter is less than 2.8, minimum lumen area is less than 6, which is 5.9 or below. If its lumen area is more than 7.5, most likely it's not significant. And in between 6 to 7.5, you should consider some additional, additional testing. So uh, for non-left main stenosis, IVS luminaria has a large, great, large gray zone. So uh, a recent meta-analysis meta suggested that to pick a significant stenosis in a, in a, in a, in a vessel that co will correlate with an FFR significant range is somewhere in the range of 2.6 millimeters square. But the sensitivity and specificity is rather low. So it's not really a recommended way of identifying significant stenosis in the vessels. In this, pub, in this paper, authors recommended that if you have lumen area on the IVS of more than four millimeters square, most likely is not significant. But if it's less than four millimeters square, consider non-invasive testing or FFR. But if you really have, don't have those available, then consider lumen area stenosis measurement, black burden measurement, or lesion length measurement to help identify if you, and in the patient if this, this could be significant. For stent optimization and sizing, IVIS is, is, has this very strong data. Uh, you can use, for stent sizing, the reference area, you can use reference lumen dimension. But in some studies, they have used reference media to media or mid-wall dimension. But they are more aggressive way of measuring the uh, uh, stent sizing. But uh, those, those are two, area, two ways to uh, identify your, your uh, uh, reference segments for stent. Stent expansion and stent acquisition is extremely important. Expansion means you want to expand it to the size that you identify the vessel to be. And acquisition means that the stent struts are touching the wall. And uh, stent expansion and restenosis rates have been, have been have well studied. And in all studies, there's a stepwise decrease in the, in the, in the restenosis rate with as large as the size of the stent. And it, and it truly makes sense. For the bay metal stand, the cutoff threshold is approximately 6.5 millimeters square to have the lowest chance of uh, incident restenosis. For drug coated stand, the minimum stand area is range, ranges between 5 to 5.7. So those are two, two numbers you may want to remember. And uh, for clinical outcome standpoint, the, the IVS has been shown to reduce uh, in meta-analysis outcome, but in, but in randomized studies, it, it has been shown to reduce the risk of ischemic-driven target lesion devascularization. IVIS has also been used to, uh, uh, to minimize the use of contrast, and we frequently use, this, use it for that purpose. And you don't have to use too many pictures for sizing, optimizing the stand, placement of the stand, and will help reduce the use of contrast. Guidelines recommend give it a two-way indication for use in left main, indeterminate left main lesions and for mechanism of, uh, to determine mechanism of instant restenosis. Use of IVS for a variety of reasons is not very common. This is a data from 2013. Less than 10% of the patients who undergo PCI, the IVS is being used. So in short, IVS allows better delineation of quality, quantity, of plaque burden. It's used for, uh, to guide invention, intervention, especially in complex cases. And lumen area for left main, to remember, is less than 6 millimeters square. FFR is a, that's it, okay. Can I go to get two minutes? One minute, okay. FFR is a, is a pressure drive 
measurement, uh, where you, where you, it's a ratio of distal pressure to, to uh, aortic pressure at peak maximum hyperemia. And, and, uh, and ratio uh, at peak maximum hyperemia assumes that the resistance through the vessel is, is constant and minimum. And a ratio of less than 0 0.80 is associated with ischemia. And this just shows that the FFR is depend same degree of stenosis, depending on the size, size of the myocardium supplied, may give you significant or insignificant results. So it's really driven by the, by the, by the, by the, by the hemodynamic significance of the stenosis. Give nitrate, you can use adenosine, intracoronary or intravenous doses. Three studies to remember, defer uh, study, FAME study. The first study was in stable ischemic heart disease patient. FAME study, Dr. Ramchandani mentioned, was in multivessel CAD, showed benefits. And the FAME 2 trial in stable ischemic heart disease shows significant reduction in MACE in patients with uh, uh, FFR-driven uh, guided PCI. Right now, at least for, as of 2011, it has a class 2A indication for intermediate lesion assessment, whereas the AUC is given it, it pretty much indication for, uh, for all the, almost all the scenarios in case where you have intermediate stenosis and don't have ischemia proven by a non-invasive stress test. So this is just a technique. I think you will get that training in your uh, hands-on. So the so FFR is a uh, uh, is a excellent way of uh, hemodynamic assessment of the significance of stenosis. Right now, utilization is still minimum, probably driven by the time of cost of the procedure. So in short, FFR optimizes benefits of PCI, improves clinical outcomes. It's particularly used for to driving decisions of doing PCI in intermediate stenosis and is better than IVIS in physiologic assessment of coronary stenosis. Thank you. Thanks.